welcome to Cubby TV. This is Steve Cubby, your host. Today we're going to be talking to John Davis, the CEO of the Northwest Patients Resource Center and Executive Director of Cannabis Standards and Ethics, a group that promotes self-regulation of the cannabis industry. And John recently attended this meeting of the Washington State Liquor Control Board in which a lot of medical marijuana patients showed up to express their concern that their rights under Washington State's medical marijuana laws would be compromised by uh, I-502 and the Liquor Control Board. Now, John, you were there. What did you see? What happened? And what's your analysis of where this is all going? The hearing was to uh, testif give testimony on the draft rules as written. Um, so what I saw, though, was uh, a lot of people that had a real fundamental misunderstanding about process. First, you have to understand what the proper venue for, for venting is. And then you have to consider, are these people going to listen to my message or I'm just going to anger them, you know, and make them think that, look, there's already the impression out there that medical uh, cannabis is a sham. I don't think that um, yelling and screaming and accusing uh, is particularly effective at changing policy. And yes, I want medical to stay. Therefore, screaming and yelling at the Liquor Control Board representing medical cannabis um, is not a good political strategy. So John, do you think that the concerns that patients have that their rights are going to be compromised under I-502 are valid? And uh, what's the answer? Absolutely valid, because a number of politicians are absolutely thinking, yeah, we'll just go down the road. They'll just go to the pot shop. And so it is a, uh, a time where a lot of political strategy has to play out. But you've got to understand, there's more to politics than screaming and yelling. What we need to do is we need to be effective in our legislature. We are going to have to, it is a must in this next legislative session, which is a short session, get legislation through. And it, yes, it's going to have to have a licensing system. Look, otherwise the U.S. attorney is going to go after you. She's, they, the, both of them have said that. Um, and the city of Seattle is going to require people to have licensing by January 1st, 2015. So yeah, we got to go through the legislature now and we have got to get a bill passed. And that involves politics, real politics. The concerns are valid. Uh, the Liquor Control Board would like to see the systems be one and the same. But we need to not just scream and yell about we need medical. We need to get them to understand why and that's a nuanced thing because from their point of view it's like why you've got legal pot just go get some pot but you know us in the community and and uh we as patients know that it is a lot more difficult than that if we actually want to see medical survive have to play real politics and real politics involves real strategy and uh, because, yes, we have some very difficult obstacles to overcome here, and we can do it. And I would love to see more unity in the community, but I understand that that might not be possible with some people. Um, but really, we can't let fear stop us from um, being effective. We need to, look, the thing about systems, you need to play within systems to affect change. That's just the way the world works. Um, you know, you don't see the, you know, the forest lobby, you know, going down and uh, yelling at the legislature, you know, the warehouser's lobby, because they, they would be making enemies, right? People are people, humans are humans. And when you start yelling at them, it doesn't matter if you're making sense or even if you have a point. You're yelling at another human that other human's not gonna like it. And do I 
do I believe in um, uh, protest as a political tool? Yes, when used appropriately, when in the appropriate venue. Um, it can be a very effective tool, but it's not our only tool. And it ends, uh, ends up basically the medical patients outside yelling in when they could uh, be more effective by being inside, by, be, by working within those systems, because otherwise you're just gonna get excluded. What are some of your biggest concerns with I-502? Uh, well, it's federally illegal. <laughs> Let's start with that being a concern. Um, and uh, I mean, banks won't play with us, right? Investment is very odd. Um, you have uh, the 280E issue. Uh, you know, how do you even survive as a business if you can't take standard business deductions? Will it even work? When we turn the system on, Will uh, will we see cannabis in it? You know, the thing about it is uh, you have to get a license to grow it. Um, and you have to get uh, a building. And then you have to do a design. And then you have to go through permitting. And I've done it. It's not an easy process. And it's not a quick process. And then you have to get occupancy. And then it takes some time to grow cannabis. So in this years time where this is going on where does the cannabis for the shops come from can't come from outside the system you know and i think that that's what a lot of people are going to find they're going to find that uh, they're going to get a recreational license and not be able to actually get any cannabis to s sell and it's outside of the law to sell anything except for cannabis or cannabis paraphernalia so i think that you'll see a lot of these places open up and simply become head shops because they're not they don't have a supply of cannabis John, the provision for driving uh, where five nanograms of cannabis in your system uh, a month after you tried it is enough to get you a criminal DUI driving under the influence of drugs conviction uh, seems pretty unrealistic. Uh, what, what, what's the solution to that situation? The DUID uh, that was written into the law is unscientific and arbitrary and does need to be changed. Um, and hopefully we can change that with some science, maybe some cognitive-based impairment testing or some method. But politically, you're going to have impairment laws. I mean, you had it before 502. Only the standard was one nanogram because that's what they test for, and they could charge you at one nanogram. At least that, this sets the bar a little higher. Certainly not scientific. Needs to be changed. But we're, we're going to be unable to change it until we can get to where you need a simple majority as opposed to a super majority in the legislature. But those are the conversations, absolutely, that the community should come together and talk about, yes, it's wrong. How do we change it? I mean, we can't simply just write it out of the law because if we do, we're still, I mean, it still exists on the books elsewhere and it's back to one nanogram. So let's talk about how we can change it. Yes. We should go to electronic cognitive testing. There's been a lot of study on it and it shouldn't matter why you're impaired behind the wheel. If you're impaired, you're impaired. Now, are there problems with that system too? Yeah, um, and perhaps science will come up with a better uh, way to see uh, um, if someone is, you know, actively high, but with marijuana, it's it's different than alcohol, so it's it's a much more difficult process. But conversations need to be had, and they need to be had with politicians because just saying this law is wrong is not going to change the law. Uh, you need to be engaged in order to change things. All right, well, that about wraps it up for today's show. And John Davis will be joining us tomorrow. We'll be talking about Jamin Shively, the Microsoft executive who has publicly announced that he wants to develop a national brand and national distribution for uh, corporate cannabis. So uh, we'll find out more about uh, multimillionaire Potrepreneur Jamin Shively tomorrow. 
can join us then. Until then, this has been Steve Cubby. You can catch our show on Cubby TV, Pot TV, Cannabis Culture, and other premium websites on the Internet. Until then, this has been Steve Cubby wishing you a great 420 day. It's the proximity.